I was a young man. I was a youth pastor in Paris, Texas. I've been there for about three years. And um, a good friend of mine by the name of Danny Clancy was the youth pastor in Odessa. And he asked me to come down to Odessa to do a Discipleship Now weekend. So I went down to Odessa, and I'd never been to Odessa before. And he introduced me to this church. And this church was a massive church. I've never seen anything like that church before. It was on four square blocks of the city downtown had these massive buildings. The youth ministry had their own building, this gigantic auditorium. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting Jerry Thorpe for the very first time when I was on that excursion at a Discipleship, discipleship Now weekend for Danny Clancy. And as I was sitting in their staff meeting as I went to their church, I was just in awe and amazement of the interaction of how that church worked how all the functions work together and how the youth ministry work together and the, and the music ministry work together and how uh, Jerry communicated with the staff and how everything worked together. And I, I was from a small church and I've never seen a church with 11 staff members and, and a church of multi-million dollar facilities paid off over four block area and been a pastor there for 36 years and all these things were in awe of me. And when I became a pastor, I started looking back at those areas that I need to find somebody that would be able to, uh, that I could emulate and somebody that I could communicate with about doing certain things and doing the right thing and doing it the right way. And so Jerry and I have worked on a friendship over the last 15 years, and, and I thoroughly enjoy him. I enjoy listening to him speak. I enjoy his friendship, and I, I enjoy his advice. And uh, sometimes uh, you find that guy, and you just, you just want to soak it all in and find all the information uh, he has, and he is the only person that I have given total freedom to, that if he has a vacancy at any place on his calendar, any week of the year, he could call me up, and I would step aside so he could have our pulpit, because he is the man that I respect the most of the pastors that have gone before me. So, Jerry, will you come on up and minister to us? Thank you. Thank you, man. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I'm going to give you some biblical encouragement on the subject of anger. The title of the message is Drop the Rocks. And in your bulletin, there's an outline. Really love for you to fill in the blanks as we go through the message. I think it's a great way for you to remember where we're, we, we've been. Let me begin by taking a little survey this morning, okay? What I would appreciate some honesty in this crowd about this survey. How many of you say, you know, Jerry, with the challenges of life and marriage and children and my job and all the stuff that life is, I know I can use some encouragement on anger. Be honest. How many of you raise your hand on that? Okay. How many of you say, while I'll admit I need some encouragement on anger, the person I'm married to needs some preaching on anger? How many like, okay, quite a few like that too. How many of you say, I'm raising a teenager, I got a right to be mad? Okay. <laughs> I don't, I guess we're all the same. It, it seems like there are an awful lot of short fuses in our society. I bet we could all make the same list. Drivers on the streets are angry. There are angry kids at school where the schools meet. There are angry people at the workplace. There are angry fans in the stands at sporting events. And have you ever seen so many people in your life just angry in America about politics? And even in our churches, people can get angry about something, generally pretty trivial, and create all kind of havoc. And even family members are angry. Too many American homes are characterized by temper tantrums, and sometimes breaking and throwing and shouting at each other, and even leads to what we've been dealing with here lately, in the media at least, domestic violence, where if you look at it, it's almost staggering and the number of women in America that are killed every day by domestic violence, which is anger in a home just gone viral. Terrible things for people who love each other to allow themselves to do. There's a verse in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9, it is better to live in the corner of a roof than share a house with an angry wife. The Drifters in 1962 sang a song called Up on the Roof. That was written by a guy whose wife was mad all the time. That's the reason he was up there on that roof. 
One husband told a marriage counselor, I'm just temperamental, to which his wife replied, yeah, he is 98% temper and 2% mental. <laughs> and one wife said, you know, I have a fierce temper, but I suppose that's my cross to bear. To which her pastor replied, no, that's not really your cross. That's your sin. It's your husband's cross to bear. But obviously, if we don't deal with anger, it will cause us to say things, do things, write things we will regret for the rest of our lives. Years ago, somebody told me a little saying, speak when you're angry, and you'll make the very best speech you'll ever regret. Of course, we all get angry on occasion. Maybe it doesn't seem like that big a deal to you, but I think the Bible's pretty plain about the dangers of not dealing with our anger. So we're going to Ephesians chapter 4. In your Bible, if you'd like to find and follow along. If not, it will be on the screen, but you might like to follow along in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 26. And I'm going to give you six thoughts, practical thoughts about anger this morning that will be listed there in your bulletin. All right, Ephesians 4 verse 26. The first sentence, point one is this. Be ye angry and sin not. Second point, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Now you'll find these in progression. God said, first of all, let's deal. What's making you so angry, lest it become a part of your life and you become an angry person. And if you mess up on those first two, then the third thought is neither give place to the devil. Because when you don't deal with your anger and it becomes a part of your life, then you're mighty close to doing things you'll really be sorry you did. Because we open the door for the devil to lead us in paths we don't want to go. And then the fourth is in verse 29. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Because when we're angry, we speak in a way that sometimes a little bit later we wish we could stuff right back in our mouth. So God said, don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but rather that which is good for the use of building other people up. And then the fifth thought is in verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. And then the sixth point is the last two verses, where God said in verse 31, here's what I want you to do with anger. Let anger and bitterness and wrath and clamor and malice and so forth be put away from you. In other words, God said, you've got a decision in this. Put it away from you and replace it with something. Empty your heart of that and replace it with being kind and tenderhearted and forgiving one another. And then God just kind of wraps it up in the last part of verse 32. The reason you can do this is because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So let's talk about it a little bit. You got your pencil ready to go? Point one, anger is a warning light. Anger is a warning light. Be angry, but do not sin. Now, anger in of itself is not sin. The Bible tells us, if you read your Old Testament... 18 different times God became angry at sin and rebellion and unrighteousness. And if I ask you, can you go to the New Testament and tell me a time Jesus was angry? And you can say, of course. He became angry, made a little whip, cleansed the temple of those who were desecrating the house of God. Now, when anger in our life takes the form of righteous indignation... It can give us courage to stand up against evil and injustice. But when anger takes the form of what it usually is in our life, which is selfishness or vengeance, it can destroy lifelong relationships or lifetime achievements. It's like a fire. A fire can warm your house, and that is good. But a fire can burn down your house, and of course that is bad. And the distinction is a fire is to be controlled. If you have a fire at your house and the fire department comes out, as soon as they put out the fire, the first thing they're looking for is what caused the fire? Why did this get out of hand? What made the fire? That's what Paul is talking about in this verse. He is challenging you to see what is behind your anger. 
When you start to get mad, stop and say, whoa, whoa, what's making me so angry? What's the motivation that I think anger is the answer to this particular problem? And the reason Paul says deal with it here, because anger always leads to something else you don't want it to lead to. So deal with it up front. Uh, told the first hour, I've been married for, as of June 2nd of this year, 56 years to a lovely girl that we met when we were kids, and so we've been married forever and ever and ever. And I am six foot four, and she is not. So I drive an SUV, but she drives a little Nissan ZX, which fits her very, just perfectly, a little. And when we were, you know, been married long enough that we could afford for her to get a car like this, I was pretty naive about everything, really. And now and then in the morning, she would say, Jerry, would you like to drive my car today? It's a little sports car. You'd have fun. You'd be cool driving my little car. And, you know, like a sheep led to the slaughter. I never figured that out for the longest time. So I said, oh, okay, sure. And you know, it's like putting a sardine in a can to get me in that car. And I, would, and I learned something right off. The only reason she ever asked me to drive her car was because she was out of gas. <laughs> right? And so she wanted me to drive the car because I would go and get the car filled up. So I would get in it, back out, and start down the road, and I would hardly get started till I could hear a little Asian voice say to me, a female voice, fuel level is low. Fuel level is low. You know what that is? It's a warning voice. Now, some people get ticked off about the voices and the warning lights, and they take them off of their car. But the problem is not that girl talking to me. The problem is not the light. The problem is I've got an empty gas tank. What the Apostle Paul is challenging us to do is to see what lies. What may, why are you getting mad? Is it frustration? Is that the way you deal with frustration or not? When you get frustrated about something, you just get mad about it and that's your answer to the frustration and take it out on others? Is it disappointment in yourself because maybe it's something you did that was really you wish you had never done or maybe some of your dreams are not coming true? Sometimes fear will make us angry. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples were on a boat. They're on the Sea of Galilee. There came up a big storm, and the disciples got frightened that the boat was going to overturn, they're going to be washed under and die, and Jesus was asleep. And if you read it in Mark 4, they went and they woke up Jesus, and with angry voices, they said this, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus got up. And he did not say to them, why are you so angry? What he said to them is, why are you so afraid? It's like Jesus said, don't you know who I am? Don't you believe I'm the son of God? Don't you know this boat can't sink with me in it? Why are you so afraid? I think most of our anger is just selfishness. Do you ever come home from work and you're already ticked at your boss maybe? Or maybe you are the boss and you're ticked at your people at work for you? And then the traffic makes you madder and then the stock market's gone down and your team lost the big game last night and the weather doesn't look good for your games and so you come home and you're, you're, you're already mad. And you walk in and your little kids are just being kids. They're just doing what kids do, but all of a sudden you're all over them, that's selfishness. You come home and your wife is just your wife. She can do the littlest thing and all of a sudden you explode. That's selfishness. Most anger, I think, is selfishness. I, I want things to go my way. I want her to do it the way I want her to do it. I want her to react the way I want her to react. And if everything doesn't go my way, I get a, that's selfishness. And I think sometimes anger is just habit. It's how we've allowed ourselves to handle difficulties. And when something just crosses in any way, we just get angry. Well, what Paul is saying in this first verse is this. Anger is a warning light. 
So when you start to get angry, why don't you stop and say, whoa, 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 is this really worth it? What is making me so angry? Maybe the car needs gas. Maybe the tires need aired up. What is making me so angry? Second point. Anger can become your disposition. The verse says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Don't become an angry person. Don't let it become your disposition. As Bruce said, I pastored the same church, church I grew up in for a long, long time. And there were people in the church that were angry people. You knew when they were walking towards you in the hall, they're mad about something because they're always angry about something. It's the kind of people, when they're walking towards you, you start praying for the rapture. Lord, take me out of here before they get to me, you know. Those things. They're just, they're, some are just angry people. Let me ask you guys a question, you married guys. Single guys don't understand. Married guys. Did you ever have an argument with your wife one afternoon? And then take it to bed with you? Take your argument to bed with you? And then genius that we are, we escalate the argument when we get in bed and all of a sudden the argument gets really heated until again, genius that we are, we jump out of bed, throw the covers, stomp out of the bedroom, slam that bedroom door so hard that it knocks off that little plaque that says, God bless our happy home, right there on the floor. <laughs> and you walk off and, and stomp off and you sleep on the couch or you sleep in the other bedroom. Let me ask you a question. Did you get a good night's sleep? Did you wake up refreshed? No, anger became your disposition. And the Bible is plain that we should not tolerate anger. Don't let it linger unresolved in your life. Don't let it become your disposition. A lady at a church invited the pastor, please go visit my husband who won't come to church with me. And he went to his home and the man said, you know, preacher, I am not particularly an unreligious man, but if Christianity would make me as angry as my wife is, I don't really want any part of it. You know something? Nothing I do, it's on your screen, can hurt God's character. God's character is all the same, always, no matter what I do. But an angry Christian really hurts God's reputation. If you're an angry person at your job and people know you're in Glenville, you don't hurt God's character, but you sure mess up his reputation. You're an angry teenager in your life, you don't hurt God's character, but you could sure mess up his reputation. Uh, first point, anger is a warning light. So when you start to get angry, stop and say, whoa, 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 what needs to be repaired? How's a better way to handle this? Why am I letting myself get mad? Anger is a warning light. Anger can become your disposition. Don't let it become your disposition. Because it, when it does, the third point comes in, which is anger opens the door to a greater evil. And the Bible says, neither give place to the devil. Don't give the devil a foothold. Hang on. All of us know, we've been angry enough to know, that when we get mad, we say things, do things, throw things right things that we really wish we hadn't done. Because anger opens the door to a greater evil. Let me give you a biblical illustration of this, and that's the story of Cain and Abel. When Adam and Eve, the first couple, first two children, boy, two boys born, one Cain and one Abel. And obviously the God that they worshiped had told them, how he wanted to be worshipped, and I think God had said, this is when I want to be worshipped, because both boys brought their offerings seemingly at the same time. And Abel brought a blood sacrifice. It was a picture of 4,000 years later when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would die on a cross. It was the way God obviously had asked them to approach him that I understand one day God will give a sacrifice that will take away sin forever. Cain, on the other hand, brought the works of his hands. He wanted to impress God with who he was and what he had done. So he stacked it all up, and I suspect it was pretty magnificent before God. And then God responded. 
The Bible says, it's on your screen, follow along on your screen. The Bible says that God did not respect Cain and his offering. In other words, God rejected it. Okay, now follow. And Cain was very angry. Anger is a warning light. And the second phrase is, and his countenance, his appearance fell. In other words, anger became his disposition. Then God tried to reason with him. Cain, why are you so angry? Anger's a warning light. Why are you so angry? Why don't you analyze? Why are you so angry? Second, why have you, has your countenance fallen? Why have you allowed anger to become your disposition? And then God tries to reason with him. Cain, if you did the right thing, if you did what I asked you to do, you would have been accepted. But if you don't do the right thing, notice what the Bible said, sin lies at the door. Sin is crouching at the door, the ESV says. The devil is looking to gain a foothold. So what did Cain do? Did he listen to God? Did he analyze it? No. Cain in his smoldering anger killed his brother. I want to ask you a question. Was the problem between Cain and Abel? No. The problem was between Cain and God. Abel got the fallout. The first murder was because of anger. That's generally the way it happens in our lives. When we allow anger to become our disposition, innocent people that are a part of our life get the fallout. And God said, don't let that happen. Don't give the devil a foothold. Here's an interesting verse, Proverbs 14, 17. An angry person does foolish things. If we had a testimonial this morning and we had a little time and we just kind of went up and down all the rows and said, tell us a time that you got mad and did something that you probably wouldn't have done, you probably wouldn't have said if you hadn't been mad, your life would have been better if you hadn't done either one, we all could contribute to it. An angry person does foolish things. The humorist Will Rogers once said, when you fly off the handle, you seldom make a safe landing. Now, most of you are probably too young to remember the Amos and Andy radio and television shows, but some of you would. And one of their classic shows, Amos is going along the street. He's got an overcoat. It's got a bulge in the front of it. And he meets his friend Andy. And Andy said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to meet a friend. And he said, why do you have a bulge in the front of your overcoat? He said, because when I talk to this friend, he pokes me in the chest when he's talking to me. And that makes me mad. So I got two sticks of dynamite taped to my chest right here. And this time, when he pokes me on the chest, I'm going to blow his fingers off. Now let me ask you a question. If the guy pokes him in the chest and he sets the dynamite off, is he going to blow his fingers off? Yeah. Is that all the damage that's going to be done? No. 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 An angry person does foolish things. Have you ever heard somebody say, and I don't know how many times I've heard this, boy, Jerry, I'm so mad. The way they've treated me, the way they've done this, it could be an ex-partner or somebody. I am so mad at mother or somebody. I'm going to go give them a piece of my mind. You ever heard anybody say that? You ever said that? I'm going to go give them, I'm going to go get even on this deal. So we stick a couple of sticks of dynamite and off we go and set off our dynamite. And do you hurt them? Probably. But do you hurt yourself worse? Yeah. Let me give you some thoughts on this. Proverbs 29, 22. A hot-tempered man commits many sins. Second one. Anger is a wind that blows out the lamp of the mind. You will do things when you're angry you would never do if you're not mad. It blows out the lamp of the mind. And then third, a great verse from the book of James. This is, uh, that and I do a marriage seminars and, and uh, one of the things I say to marriage couples, this is one of the greatest verses you can read for your marriage. Because in our marriages, when we get a little aggravated about something, the volume just gets louder and louder and louder and we try to out shout, out hurt, out insult, and just gets crazy. 
just, just gets louder and louder. So this is crude, and I know you teach your kids not to say it, but in my marriage seminar, I will say sometimes, you know what, most of our marriages, somebody needs to shut up. Shut up. Somebody gets mad, you shut up. And be swift to hear. Look them right in the eye and say, look, I know you're mad. Tell me what is making you so mad. And be swift to hear. And slow to speak. You don't have to react. You don't have to get your licks in. Be slow to speak and really slow to anger. Because you see, anger leads to a greater evil. And then the fourth point is this. Anger is expressed in words. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for building others up. I suspect all of you have lived long enough to realize that angry words can be used like a weapon. A husband can slice his wife with angry words. A wife can slice her husband and hurt deeply with angry words. You teenagers can really, really hurt your parents by just getting mad and saying things that later you probably wish, but boy, it really hurt your mama, hurt your daddy. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one who speaks like the piercing of a sword. You ever heard any of Taylor Swift's music? One of her songs is, All You're Ever Gonna Be Is Mean. Why you gotta be so mean? Did you ever wonder if people in your life might be saying, Honey, why you gotta be so mean? Why you gotta be so mean? See, a real test of my Christianity and your Christianity is not how we talk in here on Sunday morning. A real test of your Christianity is maybe how you talk to the white person on Friday night when your meal went wrong. Or how you talk when you're driving. Or how you talk when you're squeezed, when something squeezes you, so to speak. Or how you talk in your home. It's a real test of our Christianity. The Bible said a husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and died for it. And a wife is to love her husband. And parents are to love the children. And children are to love their parents. And if we love each other, the Bible says in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love is not easily angered. If you love someone, how could you so easily get so angry? Paul said that shouldn't be. And the whole point of this, this deal is don't misunderstand the impact of angry words. You can say things and go back later and say, well, they know I didn't mean it. No, they don't know any such thing. All they know is what they heard. The Bible says again in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, great verse, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up more anger. Fifth point, anger distances us from God. The Bible says, and this is a frightening verse, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was a freshman in college. And that night when I, I mean, it was in a service like this and, and the pastors invited us just to walk to the front and accept the Lord. And that's exactly what I did. I don't care if all the president of the United States had been there. I was going to get that settled that night, midterm of my freshman year in college. And when I walked out of that building that night, I had a sense of forgiveness and peace. First time in my life I'd ever had peace with God. And it was just so beautiful. But when I walked out, I didn't look any different. My outward appearance, I guess, was the same. But something had happened to me. I didn't even realize it as much that night as I realized it the next day. I, I knew I had the peace. I knew I had the feeling of joy and all of that. But I didn't realize really the next day that someone had moved into my life and that my body had become the temple of the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of God. 
The Bible says when we accept Christ, the Spirit, our body becomes the temple. He lives in us. He's like a resident coach. Because the next day, I, I, I was in college, I was working on a construction job, unloading railroad boxcars of, of building material and taking it to the job site and loading it off the truck. That's before they had the deals that just picked them up with the, the machinery and stuff. We unloaded the bricks and everything by hand. It was a hard job. And I worked with a group of guys that talked the way I talked before I was saved. And the next day, we're riding down the road, and, and just out of habit, I said some stuff that I had always said it, never bothered me. But all of a sudden, for the first time, something inside of me said, mm, no, Jerry, don't want to say that. That's not language you should use. What is that? That's the Spirit of God. What's he doing? He's a resident coach in my life. He's a coach that God puts within me to help me make good decisions. And the thing I understood is when I got angry, I don't listen to the coach very well. I want to do what I want to do. And the Bible said, don't grieve, don't reject, don't ignore the Spirit of God. I mean, that's the one that seals you to the day of your eternal redemption. I mean, the Holy Spirit is one friend I cannot afford to alienate. Now to our last point, point six. Anger can be replaced by Christ-like qualities. And we emphasize the verses. Let bitterness and wrath and everything, put that away from you. And replace it with kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiving. I want to ask you a question. How do you deal with anger in your life? I mean, you start to get angry, you want to stop it. How do you, how do you deal with it? Some have said, okay, suppress it. Just beat it down, down. But that's hard. It's hard to suppress anger because it's like a beach ball. It keeps under, you can't keep it under, it keeps getting out. And others say, well, ventilate your feelings. Scream if you get mad. But I know when I get angry, if I start yelling, I get madder. So how do we deal with it? Well, I think most of you remember the, the movie Forrest Gump. It won an Academy Awards. Great movie. You remember at the close of that movie when Forrest and Jenny had got married and they came back to that dilapidated, that dilapidated old house where she grew up and it was now just crumbled and fallen and it was Forrest and Jenny and they had a child and they came back to that old house where you realize she had a lot of sexual abuse from her father. You remember when the movie first started and Forrest just a little guy and he came over for he and Jenny to play and she came running out of the house with her father calling for her to come back and she came running out and ran out through the corn and, and Forrest was after her. And now they come back to this old house where her father had sexually abused her. And all of a sudden, all of those feelings of frustration and everything in Jenny's life came. And you remember what she did? She began to pick up rocks and throw them at the house and pick up rocks and throw them at the house. And the photography and everything is incredible. She threw the rocks and threw the rocks and threw the rocks and threw the rocks until at last she fell exhausted. And Forrest Gump looked at her and said quietly, sometimes there just aren't enough rocks. There just not enough rocks. And that's the reason I call this message Drop the rocks. Over 20 years ago, and I want to give this guy credit, an Illinois pastor called Jim Nicodem preached a sermon on angry, anger that I got a hold of the cassette tape and it really kicked me off on this message and I appreciate very much his message. And in his message, he quoted a guy, Dr. Les Carter, who wrote a book called Good and Angry, who made the statement, anyone who lives a life of anger is choosing to do so. Whoa, 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 Jerry, no, 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 no. Jerry, look, my grandmother was an angry woman, and because she was an angry woman, my mother is an angry woman, and because my mother's an angry woman, I'm an angry woman too. I'm just like my mother and my grandma. It's not really my fault. No, you're wrong. That's your cop-out. Your grandmother was an angry woman because she chose to be an angry woman, and your mother was an angry woman because she chose to be an angry woman, and if you're an angry woman, you have chosen to be an angry woman. And Paul said, don't choose it. We've all got a choice in this matter of anger. Don't 
Choose it. Put it away from you. You can just say, I'm not going to be angry. I'm going to control my anger. I'm not going to do all of the terrible things that anger caused me to do. I'm going to, re- I'm, going to, I'm going to put it away and I'm going to replace it, as God said, with kindness, compassion. And I'm going to forgive the way God, for Christ's sake, forgave me. When I walked to the altar as a freshman in college, so lost. There was no reason for God to mess with me. But for Christ's sake, he forgave me. Here's a scary verse in uh, Proverbs. The Bible says, if you please give me my next verse, God is angry with the wicked every day. And, and, and there are those in this world, increasingly so in America, say, yep, that's the God of the Old Testament. That's the God of the Bible. He's up there, he's mad, he's squashing people and stuff like that. He, just, he would just tickle to death when he can hurt you. Really? The Bible also says, John three sixteen that God so loved the world that he gave his son to die on a cross. How do you put God is angry and he gave his son to die on a cross? How do you put that together? There's a beautiful story in Luke 15 about a great father. For my message this morning, the father is a type of God. And he had a son who's a type of me and maybe you. And his dad was a good dad and bestowed so much favor on his boys. But this boy didn't want it. He wanted to take everything God gave, like God gave me life and breath and opportunity. And for 18 years, I got as far away from God as I could. And that's what this boy, dad, give me the portion of goods that's mine. And he got it and he got as far away from his dad as he could. And when he got as far away from everything that his dad was and stood for, the Bible said he wasted it in riotous living. His older brother said later, he wasted everything dad gave him on prostitutes. He just lived on the lowest level of life. The party, and all of a sudden, his dad's money ran out. And he didn't have a job. And when the money ran out, the friends ran out, and the girls found other guys that had money. And all of a sudden, he's by himself, and he doesn't have a job, and he's broke and hungry, and he ends up in a pig pen. For a Jewish boy, that's the worst place you could end up. And he's a pig pen, and he's starving. He's covered in mud. His hair is matted. He's stinking. You could smell him before you could see him. He is totally and completely messed up. And he starts thinking about his dad. And it wasn't, I'm going to go home and say, Dad, I'm your boy, put me back. No, it wasn't that at all. He was in repentance. He said, I'm going to go home to my father. And I'm going to say, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. I've disgraced you. I haven't been worthy of, of your love toward me and your goodness toward me. I'm not worthy to be your son. I'm willing to be a hired servant. Dad, I'll work out in the stables. I'll go out and chop the weeds in the field. Dad, just let me hang around the house somewhere. Just let me come home. And he started down the road. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you think when that boy left and took the money and, and the words came back, I mean, his older brother knew what he had done, that his daddy also, you think his dad was happy about the way he was living? No. You think his dad might have been angry about the way he was living? Yes. Every day. But you read the story, what is so beautiful. His dad was always watching for him. He, 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 when he finally came down the road, his dad saw him when he was a long way down the road. Read your Bible. He was way down the road and his daddy saw him, which meant he'd been looking for him to come home, been wanting him to come home. Back when I used to preach to teens, Bruce's guys in, in earlier years, I, I, I used to picture mama coming out and saying, honey, do you see our boy? Is he coming home? And he said, well, honey, as far as I can see down the road, said, dad, build a ladder. And, and he built a ladder so he could get up higher and look further down the road. And every day he said, no, I don't see anybody. But one day he said, Mama, I think that's our boy. And he came from the ladder and he ran down the road. And when he got to that boy, dirty, stinking, covered in pig mud and everything, when he got to that boy, the boy started his dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. Dad, I want to come home and be like it was. I'm not worthy of that. Dad, just make me as one of your servants. But his dad 
put his hand over his mouth and said, shh, you're my boy. You were lost and you've come back home. You've been found. And he put a robe around him where you couldn't see his filthiness and put a ring on his finger and said, let's kill the fatted calf and rejoice because my boy's come home. You see, I get sappy on this, but that's what happened to me. I'm sitting in an audience just like you, and somebody's telling me that God loved me and Jesus died for me, and I knew what I'd been doing. I mean, I was in a pig pen. Some of you, before you got saved, were in a pig pen, were you not? And yet the Lord loved you, and when you came home, he met you along the road, and he put his arms around me, and he ushered me into his family. Not because I deserved it, I deserved nothing. He forgave me because Christ died on a cross. And God said, and Paul said, if God can forgive you, you can forgive anybody. Who's done anything worse to you than what you have done to Jesus Christ? So I just wonder this morning, are you out there somewhere? See, when this boy left home, he didn't intend to end up in the hog pen. But sin will take you further than you intended to go. Nobody ever took the first drink. Come on, come on, take a drink. Just try it. You never intended to be an alcoholic. Nobody took their first deal of dope, ever intended to be strung out. Nobody had ever opened their computer and looked at porn, ever thought they would be captured by it, which can destroy your life and your morals and your marriage and your family and everything. You, certainly your relationship with God. You never intend for that to happen. But sin will always take you further than you wanted to go. And it will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. But thankfully, God wants you to come back home. And I suspect in an audience this size, some of you need to come back. You need to, come, you need to get up wherever you are. I don't care what pig pen. And come back to the Father. And you ought to do it now. Just come quietly. And just pray the simplest of prayers. God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm wrong. I know you love me. I believe in you. I want you to forgive my sin and come into my life. I, I receive you now. I believe on you now as my Savior. That's what I prayed tonight. God changed my life. Let's bow our heads for, for the prayer.